Good afternoon, class. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to begin with prayer, and if one of you would be willing to unmute and provide a prayer, it would be much appreciated. I can say it. Uh, our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful uh, for Dr. Graves and his preparation for us uh, each week. And we ask you to please bless us with thy spirit today that we'll be able to um, learn the things that we need to be successful on the exam and also things that we can apply in our lives. And please bless Dr. Graves as well with thy spirit that he'll be able to <clears throat> um, teach us to the best of his ability. Um, we love thee and we're grateful for the gospel in our lives and we're grateful for this wonderful university that we have to study. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, okay. I don't have any of the TAs here in the room at this time, but I think they are largely done with grading exam three. Not all of the scores have been uploaded to learning screen. My hope is that they will have those all in very shortly. And you'll be able to, um, I guess it's gonna be hard to pick them up if you're on campus, but um, anyway, uh, the final is on Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday, 15th from 2.30 to 5.30 p.m. I am planning to do um, reviews on Friday and Monday uh, at our as part of our regularly scheduled class time. I know that we don't have class on Friday and Monday, but I do have the uh, Zoom uh, invitation already uh, in place for Friday starting at two, and we'll go as long as needed in Monday, the following Monday. Uh, we'll start again at two and go as long as needed. So uh, please come and ask questions as you have them. We are going to uh, ramp up chapter 18 today. Um, so uh, at, at the end of last class, we had talked um, about the process of deanimation. The issue is that uh, we take in often, as part of uh, our dietary intake, more amino acids than we need for protein synthesis. And rather than simply in some way uh, lose those, the body removes the amine group, converts the, the remnants into intermediates that are uh, inter into intermediates that are part of the citric acid cycle or the pyruvate and um, allows them to be used as a source of energy. And uh, many individuals eat more meat than anything else, and it serves as a perfectly good source of energy. We, to do this though, there uh, is this deamination process. And as I mentioned last time, <clears throat> of the 20 amino acids, common amino acids, 17 of them uh, experience a process that is common. And this involves a, a uh, process in which uh, these transaminases uh, remove the amine group from the targeted specific amino acid, uh, confer it to the enzyme. Uh, then the remnant uh, of the amino acid comes off, and a, a, another molecule, alpha ketoglutarate, comes in, receives the amine. As it receives the amine, it is converted into glutamate. Glutamate is then um, released. It is oxidized, and the further step, this in turn releases ammonium. Uh, I will mention uh, that ammonium is, uh, is a and, and nitrogen in general is a fairly scarce resource in our bodies. If you eat a lot of meat, it's not so scarce, but uh, we rely on dietary intake of uh, amino acids 
to have nitrogen for whatever purposes that we need, including synthesis, synthesis of biogenic and, uh, amines. But uh, ammonium in and of itself is actually quite toxic. And uh, we will see that we need to handle it carefully. Uh, part of this is to convert it into urea, which allows for its excretion to prevent its buildup. And uh, if you can't get rid of ammonium, it typically leads to serious uh, neurological damage, uh, even death. Um, and so it is something that uh, needs to be carefully managed within the organism. Okay, I'm going to move for slides for just a minute, and then I'm going to come back. And we'll, uh, I'm going to use the board. So this, uh, this then uh, outlines, this slide outlines the process for 17 of these uh, enzymes that remove amines from one specific amino acid. So each of these 17 amino acids is uh, the substrate, the specific substrate of one of these uh, amino transfer bases. And so, uh, as you can see, uh, in the end, the amine group of the uh, targeted amino acid ends up being transferred to alpha ketoglutarate. That uh, generates then glutamate and leaves behind this alpha keto acid, the remnant of the targeted amino acid. You'll notice that this enzyme employs PLP. We saw PLP as a um, fe feature, a factor that was used by the glycogen phosphorylase. Here it is also used at the active site, but uh, instead of it activating the phosphate, it is the um, aldehyde feature of that that is uh, utilized by these amino transferases. The glutamate produced by the uh, transfer of the amine group to alpha ketoglutarate undergoes this uh, oxidative process where ammonium is released and alpha ketoglutarate is regenerated. And this uh, allows then the alpha ketoglutarate to be recycled to go back, uh, interact with another amino transferase, receive another copy of ammonia or nitrogen amine and be converted into glutamate. Uh, as mentioned, this ammonia uh, is going to be converted ultimately into urea, but we will see that it is first converted into something called carbamyl phosphate. So just be aware of that. Okay, I'm going to leave this slide and uh, I am going to um, now go to the board. And I have already drawn it out, and hopefully you can see the steps that would be involved for the deamination of alanine. So there is then a specific alanine uh, transaminase. And uh, here is our PLP. This is the pyridoxal, pyridoxal, AL, so an aldehyde pyridoxal phosphate. It is, uh, it is bound, if you will, at the active side of the enzyme, it presents then this aldehyde group. And this is going to interact with the amine of the targeted amino acid, in this case, alanine. And as we saw uh, with uh, aldolase, uh, we can form an amine simply by the condensation of this carbonyl with this primary amine. This leads then to um, this coupling of the alanine to PLP, which in turn is held by the enzyme. There is a rearrangement of the double bond, and this is brought about by a feature on the enzyme, abstracting a proton, moving this, the, the pair of electrons that were uh, binding the hydrogen 
here, this pushes a pair of electrons out and onto the PLP. This leaves us then with the double bond on the opposing side of the nitrogen. So now it is uh, <clears throat> it is uh, uh, between the carbon, the alpha carbon of the amino acid and this uh, nitrogen. Water is brought in. This hydrolyzes this amine back to a carbonyl and the primary amine. And in this case, it leaves us now with this alpha keto acid. This is pyruvate. Uh, we have seen pyruvate in um, multiple places, but, uh, but here we see it again as the product of this deamination. We now have the uh, amine group attached to the pyridoxal phosphate. So this is pyridoxamine. And in the, um, in the next series of steps, we bring in the alpha ketoglutarate. So let me um, let me just modify this. And we will go back through this process. So now I have the amine group on. the PLP, and I'm going to bring it in as a common recipient molecule, this alpha keto glutarate. So here's alpha keto glutarate. It's going to undergo a condensation. So I'm going to reverse the direction of these reactions. So I'm going to produce water as a byproduct and now I'm going to couple the alpha ketoglutarate uh, to the amine, uh, which is in turn attached to this. I'm simply going to, mod uh, rather than draw this all out, I'm just going to show it this way. Now, in this particular case, we're going to take a proton off of here. So, Here's our base. So this will take this proton. I then form a double bond here. This pushes electrons out here. I'll pick up a <clears throat> proton from the enzyme. And now I have shifted the location of the double bond. Now I have. Um, this arrangement and in the final step i'm going to bring water in and hydrolyze this imine bond and that releases then the alpha ketoglutarate, but it is no longer alpha ketoglutarate with the amine present. We now have glutamate and we have regenerated the carbonyl uh, on the pyridoxal phosphate to allow for another round of catalysis. I know uh, that the question you would have immediately, do you need to know all the steps here? No. Do I need to draw this out? No. Do you need to do electron pushing? No. But you should know that the 17 transaminases carry out this deamination process by coupling the amine to the aldehyde, forming this imine, then a, a movement of the double bond from, um, from one side of the nitrogen to the other, hydrolysis leaving the nitrogen now on the PLP. Bring an alpha keto glutarate form an imi. We again reverse the position of the double bond, hydrolyze it, and now the amine leaves with the alpha keto glutarate. This is glutamate. Glutamate then is oxidized and uh, releases ammonia. Okay. Are there questions about this? Right. What was the name of the final product shown on the board? 
Say that again. Um, what's the name of the final product shown on the board on the left side? This final product is glutamine. Glutamate. 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 Thank you. So it is an amino acid itself, but it is, uh, there is a glutamate dehydrogenase that removes the ammonia and regenerates the applicate of glutamate in this oxidative process, allowing for further, um, the, for the applicate of glutamate to further uh, pick up in uh, ammonia uh, nitrogens. Okay, so, okay. Um, so, uh, so this, this then, the glutamate is the product of, or one of the products of each of these 17 transaminases. And this shows this glutamate dehydrogenase oxidizes the, um, out, the glutamate back to alpha ketoglutarate which then goes back and is a uh, substrate for the 17, second substrate for the 17 deaminases. Notice though that we also produce um, the, uh, we produce the uh, nitrogen here, as ammonium, uh, and this is, again, this, this can be toxic if it's allowed to build up, but this, the amination process is happening almost exclusively, or at least predominantly, in the liver. And in the liver, there is a, an, an enzyme called um, carbamylophosphate synthetase 1. And uh, we're going to. So, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, So let me uh, talk briefly about this uh, carbamyl phosphate synthetase. So if you look up uh, at the top here, uh, let's see, we, we you will see that we are um, generating, using, uh, taking nitrogen, we are generating this molecule called so this is it, but let me go back and walk you through the process. So there is an enzyme that actually carries out this multi-step process, a single enzyme called carbamylophosphate synthetase 1. In the first step, we're going to activate bicarbonate. And we've seen the activation of bicarbonate on multiple occasions. Um, in the pyruvate carboxylase step, we saw a uh, phosphate coupled to bicarbonate to activate it. Here again, this particular enzyme is able to produce this phosphorylated bicarbonate. The reason for that is bicarbonate is not sufficiently reactive to couple the ammonium to it. And so what uh, then happens is that this phosphate becomes a good leaving group. It is displaced by uh, ammonia. And this leaves us with this compound carbamate. Uh, carbamate in turn is not sufficiently reactive to undergo the first step in the urea cycle. So uh, to allow that to happen, we're going to use a second copy of ATP. We're going to use the same enzyme, the carbamylophosphate synthetase one, and we're going to activate it by adding phosphate to the carbamate. And now we have this carbamylophosphate, and it is this phosphate 
that is going to be a good leaving group, and uh, it's going to allow us to couple the carbamate uh, to a molecule called urethane. So this is the urea cycle sort of sketched out here. So here's um, ornithine. Here is the actual structure of ornithine down here. And uh, we have this carbamyl phosphate. We're going to bring the two together. There is this ornithine transcarbamylase, this enzyme with a very big name, uh, that is going to bring about the coupling of these two molecules. And it is a nitrogen with a pair of electrons on the uh, side group of ornithine that is going to attack the carbonyl carbon here on one of the carbamyl phosphate, displacing the phosphate of carbamyl phosphate and adding the carbamate to ornithine. Ornithine looks a lot like lysine, but it is one. Um, carbon different in terms of its side chain length. With the uh, coupling of the carbamate to ornithine, we now have a, a, an amino acid that is only found in the urea cycle called citrate. Ornithine is only utilized in the urea cycle. It is not used for synthetic purposes. This citrulline is going to be coupled uh, briefly to a copy of AMP, uh, and then it is going to be replaced, the AMP is going to be displaced by an aspartate molecule. This all takes place on an enzyme called arginosuccinate synthetase. Uh, again, a very long name, and this in fact produces this molecule, arginosuccinate. It's a very, very uh, large molecule that, that combines citrulline with aspartate. This is cleaved uh, into two pieces, into a fumarate and an arginine by an enzyme called arginosuccinase. So that's enzyme three of the urea cycle. And it leaves us with arginine, which is activated upon, is hydrolyzed by a, another enzyme called arginase, which actually releases then urea. Urea is an interesting molecule. It's very, it's very polar, as you can see. It's very water soluble. This allows for it being completely dissolved in solutions. It passes quickly from the uh, from the kidney through through the kidney. It's quickly excreted from the circulation. It is non-toxic, whereas ammonium is very toxic. Urea is not toxic. I mean, I guess if you ate enough of it, it would be problematic. But in terms of its presence in the circulation, it is at the levels that we see uh, normally, it is not uh, toxic. And this releases now two copies of nitrogen. One of them uh, came from a carbamyl phosphate, so this nitrogen here, but a second one comes from the aspartate that was coupled to citrulline to form the arginine and succinate. In the end, then, for one round of the urea cycle, we're able to get rid of two copies of ammonium, effectively. With two copies of nitrogen, and this keeps the body uh, from accumulating ammonia. This is all happening now in the liver, and uh, so the liver plays a great, a very significant role in detoxification, uh, not only of ammonia, but many other compounds, uh, including uh, materials that we encounter in the environment, so things that we take in perhaps as part of the diet and so forth. Uh, let me just mention very quickly, um, go back, um, that uh, there, there is ammonia produced in uh, peripheral tissues. And uh, this happens 
through deamination processes or sometimes just breakdown of amino acids releasing ammonia. Uh, there are two ways that this, uh, this ammonia that is present in peripheral tissues is moved safely to the liver where it is released and formed into carbamyl phosphate onto urea. But uh, one of these is through the formation of alanine. We had a question on the quiz that if you build a pyruvate, if there is a blockade of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the citric acid cycle, that pyruvate is converted into alanine in part to prevent the acidification of cells to the point that they cease functioning and the circulation that it becomes problematic. But the pyruvate is converted into alanine, transported to the liver, and uh, the alanine undergoes deamination, releasing uh, the, uh, the uh, ammonia to alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate. The second process is, if you can find it here, um, the formation of glutamine. So, uh, again, we're talking about um, peripheral tissues. Uh, we're going to generate uh, glutamine by coupling it to a uh, coupling glutamate to an ammonium to form glutamine. And this now is carried in the, through the circulation. It is non toxic, it is delivered to the liver. And there is a glutamase which re releases that ammonium from the uh, carb uh, carboxyl group on the side chain of glutamate and regenerates glutamate and allows the ammonium to be moved onto the formation of urea. So, alanine glutamine represent two amino acids that carry ammonium from peripheral tissues to the liver in safe ways. All right, any questions on material that we've covered today? I have one. So the peripheral tissues themselves are not going through the urea cycle. They're just allowing it to be transferred to the liver for this cycle to take place? That's correct. OK, thank you. All right. Any other last questions before I conclude my story? Can you upload this lecture to YouTube as well? Uh, yes, I, I will. Well, so <laughs> curious thing when I, so last lecture, when I got it back to um, the, to my office, I found that it was sufficiently small that I could upload the MP4 directly to Learning Suite. The lecture before that, for some reason, it was four times bigger and it required that I load it, move it to the to a YouTube channel. Uh, but this lecture, depending on the size, will either be appear as an MP4 on Learning Suite, or I will put the link to it uh, to it on the YouTube channel uh, there. So yes, I will capture this. Uh, I have two quick questions. Yeah. The first is, why is ammonia toxic? Like, why do we have to get rid of it? And the second is, what happens to urea after it's formed in the liver? Well, the urea is excreted into the circulation as it passes through the kidney. It's rapidly eliminated. Ammonium um, is a fairly strong uh, conjugate acid. Uh, but I think it is, I, I'm not fully sure all of the reasons that it's problematic, but I think it couples quite nicely to anything that contains an aldehyde or a keto group. I suspect that that probably is problematic. Uh, there is a condition, a, a medical disease called Rye syndrome. Um, it often affects children, but it is characterized by high levels of ammonia. And I'm not exactly sure why uh, the ammonia is produced. I don't think people, I don't think science knows why it is, produces high levels of ammonia, but they are very toxic and they're specifically, or more, more specifically, neurotoxic, causing very severe mental impairment, 
or death in individuals who have Lyse syndrome. And uh, ammonia would be equally problematic if it were coming from another source, like let's say some sort of chemical intoxication. All right, well, let me move you through the balance of this story. So I had failed uh, my second oral. Uh, I fully anticipated being dropped from my graduate program. I had no plan B. I had no, uh, I really had not thought seriously about what might happen if I failed. I mentioned that uh, at this particular time that there was a a conference being held. Uh, it was the brainchild of a state president up in the Boston area, a gentleman by the name of Elton Perry, whose name you should probably recognize he later became an apostle. But uh, he was at that time a state president, got this idea, and they had this effectively a young single adult conference. And I attended. And as I mentioned, there were wonderful seminars, speakers, uh, there was fun entertainment, and all in all, it was a wonderful uh, few days that I spent at this conference. The final concluding event was a testimony. Not surprisingly, this is now standard practice, but uh, this was this whole thing was novel at the time. And uh, it was a powerful and moving uh, testimony meeting. And in the midst of this testimony meeting, I had this overwhelming spiritual impression that I should go on a mission. At the time that I was 19, I was living at home. Um, I raised the subject of going on a mission with my father, and he was bitterly opposed to my doing this. He forbid it. He told me that if I went on a mission that I would be disowned, and I had no reason to uh, disbelieve my father. He was a very stubborn uh, individual, and uh, when he made it this, up his mind about something, uh, he rarely changed his mind. He was uh, rather strong will uh, in that way. And I was just honored enough that I would have defied my father. I, I would have thumbed my nose at him. But I had a younger brother who was five years younger. And I knew that if I created this division, if I created this, uh, these hard feelings around the church, that my brother would not be able to go to church. And I thought that that was a pretty significant uh, consequence of my doing something um, to defy my father. Not only that, but I, I didn't feel a strong, strong, um, uh, you know, I didn't feel, I didn't have a strong impression at that time to go on a mission. So I had not served a mission at the time that I was 19. But now I was having this impression, and, uh, and my immediate uh, concern was that uh, you know this could still lead to strife within my family. Uh, so as I went back to New, New Haven from Boston and uh, began thinking about this idea of going on a mission, I, it, it struck me that this was a great plan B. I would. You know, I'd fail my oral, I would go on a mission, and I'd have two years to sort of figure out what to do with my life, and uh, then come back and pick up where things had left on. Uh, but I was concerned about uh, how this might impact uh, my parents and my brother. But then a couple of weeks later, as I was reading my scriptures one evening, I came to the passage, I think it's in Matthew, that says something to the effect that he who loves mother and father more than he loves me is not worthy of me. And again, I had a very profound impression given me that my my father and mother would be, you know, whatever happened, it would be okay. That my heavenly father really wanted me to go on this mission, irrespective of my parents' opinion of it. 
Well, I opted to retake my oral, and um, I was, as you can imagine, not looking forward to this. I was uh, under a great deal of stress. I knew that Dr. Fowler uh, was determined to get me out of the program, whatever it took to have me fail that second oral he was going to do. And this was not reassuring. Um, and uh, so um, I did what I could to prepare, but when you are when you can be asked any question about chemistry, any field of chemistry, any aspect of chemistry, uh, any type of experiment, any type of problem, uh, it's an impossibility. Uh, I mean, I had, even in my position at that time, I had stacks of textbooks uh, that I had for classes with thousands of pages and no way to really read through those carefully and uh, prepare myself for whatever might come. Well, uh, they, this, uh, this oral was going to be on a Monday and I, I continued to have the, the strong impression that I was to go on a mission, but I was a little unclear about the timing. I assumed that Yes, I would fail, and then uh, I would go uh, sometime thereafter, uh, would leave and go back home and prepare and go from there. But then I had this peculiar, I mean, there was just this wild notion, well, what, what if a miracle should happen? What if Dr. Fowler got sick, or, you know, and, uh, and I passed my world? Uh, would I still go on my mission? Would I, or would I finish up uh, my graduate program and then go on the mission? Or, I mean, at this point, I was probably 24 years old, so not, not your typical prospective missionary. Well, I felt pretty strongly that I was to go sooner rather than later, but I wanted a confirmation of this. And so I approached a good friend who I felt was a very, who had very, who was a very spiritual person. Somebody that I felt confident could uh, provide counsel, uh, who could act as a channel, who could give me a blessing. And so I arranged to have him give me a priesthood blessing the Sunday before I was to take my oral. Uh, I fasted that Sunday. I came to my friend's home. Uh, he had set aside time to be able to do this. He knew something of the details of what was going on. Uh, but I, the question I posed to him, that what I, the counsel that I was seeking through this blessing was to know specifically whether I should go sooner or rather whether I should go later. That was the real question at hand. And, so he gave me this priesthood blessing. And shortly after starting the blessing, he confirmed that my Heavenly Father wanted me to go on this mission as soon as I could conveniently do so. And so that was a confirmation of the impressions that I'd had that, that I felt reassured getting this priesthood blessing because this was potentially a big deal. Uh, it would impact, in fact, my family and, and others. But then this friend of mine, and as part of this blessing, went on to say that during my oral, I would be asked no question that I couldn't answer. I didn't get that in writing, but I, I was, I, I, it was as clear, I mean, I, this, as if I've been hit with a stick. And uh, I, I took that at face value that I would be asked no question that I couldn't answer as part of the form. Well, that's a huge, huge promise. But it came from somebody who was in a position to fulfill that promise. I went back home. Uh, I tried to sleep. I couldn't sleep. I sort of tossed and turned all night long, about five in the morning, hours before I was to take my oral. I went to my laboratory and I just sat there and I was miserable. I was, you know, I was just so anxious, so nervous, so just 
um, uh, just rock up uh, with the prospect of having to face Dr. Fowler again. That it, I just it just preoccupied my mind. It was all that I could think about. But about an hour before I was to take this orb, I had this incredible peace come over me. It just washed over me. I was warm from head to toe. And suddenly, all of these concerns that I had about Dr. Fowler or this or that just simply melted away. And I was able to sit there and just sort of gather my thoughts and think about everything that had happened up to this point. And, and felt calm. I felt at peace, and I felt that whatever happened would be okay. Well, I went into the room. Uh, the time uh, had come, and I faced my committee, and uh, the world began. And Dr. Fowler was right off the line with incredible, incredible questions. I can't remember what it was, but it was hard. Uh, I don't even know if it had, uh, you know, I, I don't know. But anyway, he posed this question to me, and I didn't have an immediate answer. Uh, you know, nothing popped into my mind to, uh, to, to respond to him. So what I did is I turned and faced the board. It was a black board just like this, or, or a green board. Anyway, and uh, I started praying, not out loud, but I started praying. In fact, my prayer was pretty desperate, you know, something like Heavenly Father, um, this is a hard question and I really don't know where to go with this. And you remember last evening where I was promised that I would be able to answer the questions on the oral, well, if I could impose, if I could just get a little bit of help here, be much appreciated. And so as I faced this board, there was this long silence. It, I don't know how long it lasted, but it seemed very long and uncomfortable. But then I got an idea. It was just a vague idea, but it was something. I started with it. I started to write on the board. And as I wrote down this stuff, um, then my, you know, I was able to sort of take this and work with it uh, using my own sort of knowledge. And I was able to develop uh, this and to uh, actually answer the question. And as soon as Dr. Fowler saw that I was beginning to answer his question, then he stopped me and he gave me another question. And once again, it was something that was way beyond my experience, something that was very particular. And, and once again, I had no real clue as to how to start the response to his question. So once again, I turned away from my committee and I sat, sat, stood, looking at the board, pleading with my Heavenly Father for him. And once again, I got an idea. And I began to work with that idea. I began to write things on the board. I began to develop this into a coherent answer. And uh, from time to time, Dr. Fowler would say, wait a minute, that's the stupidest answer I've ever heard in my life. Do you want to stick with that answer? And I would say, yeah. I think it's a perfectly good answer. And uh, it just, it stopped him. I mean, it didn't stop him from asking questions, but it kind of quieted him. He stopped being so abusive and attacking me personally. And we went through these questions. Uh, each one was this agonizing delay as I faced the black blackboard and pleaded with my Heavenly Father again for help in answering these questions. And every time I would be given an idea, just a kernel of an idea, and I would work with it and develop it and, and to an answer. And as soon as it became apparent that I was answering the question and Dr. Fowler would stop me and would hit me with another question, and so this process went on. I, I think at some point, I don't know what I actually did retrospect, I wish I could have had the presence of mind to say something like, well, okay, these are great questions, but let's, let's, let's ask something really, really 
unknown. Let's let's ask those big, you know, sort of universal questions. You know, right now I've got this thing going on, and if you want some answers, I may be able to provide. I didn't do that, but but nevertheless, I have this. I have, <laughs> in retrospect, I, I had this process going on where I was receiving light from above. And it would have been interesting to have uh, some of these unanswered scientific questions posed and with the possibility of actually getting some insight into nature more broadly. Anyway, this process, this you know, one question after another after another went on for an hour and 45 minutes. And finally, I looked at my committee and I said, well, I said, are we good? I'm kind of getting tired. Is this enough? And they, you know, that was pretty audacious. Uh, people don't usually uh, tell the committee or ask the committee to stop, but they kind of look at one another and then they said, okay. And I went back to my lab and I sat there for a very long time. I could only imagine the discussion that was going on back in the room where I had taken my world. But after, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, my research advisor appeared and he said, well, you passed the oral. Um, it was like I don't know what was going on there with you. It was like pulling teeth to get answers. I said, yeah, I, I know. It, was, it did take a while for me, for me to respond. I said, yeah, but you did answer all of the questions. And consequently, there was, there was no way that Dr. Fowler could fail you on your own. I said, well, that's great. So guess what? I am going to leave and I'm going to take a leave of absence and I'm going to go on a mission for my church. At which point my research advisor just stared at me with his mouth open and didn't know what to say. Well, I left, I went back home, I did some work and got ready, uh, earned some money, and I did, in fact, go on a mission. It was a great experience. I came back, I resumed my studies uh, in grad school. I was successful, um, and uh, I have, it has allowed me to uh, do a number of interesting things with my life. I mention this experience because I want you to know that you are, <laughs> are loved as much as I by our Heavenly Father, by your Savior. He will sustain you in your needs if, you're, if you place your trust in Him, if you are willing to follow His direction. If you're willing to seek his direction and guidance in your life, if you're willing to follow his plan for you, I can promise you that great things will happen, miracles will happen, and that you will find success and fulfillment, not only professionally, but in all aspects of your life. I want to bear you my witness that God lives, that he loves us, that he sent his son to save us from sin and from death, but also to provide us with the needs that we have to overcome life's challenges. I promise you that it is you trust in him that you will overcome all things and be able to reach your needs. I wish to testify that uh, he sent us here not to fail, but to succeed. And he will work with us to ensure that that happens if we trust in him. And I bear you this witness. I wish you success in your lives. 
You're bright, you're capable. I expect great things of you. I hope that you uh, find great satisfaction in all that you do. I know that you will if you trust in our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And I say that all in the name of Jesus Christ. Good luck on the final. Again, I will be doing reviews. Well, I'll have my normal office hours today, uh, starting in about 15 minutes. I will do uh, a review Friday, starting at 2. So our regular class time, a regular class invite to get into Zoom. Uh, I will start at 2 and go as long as uh, people want to do it. And I will do that again Monday of next week. Uh, again, we our Zoom class uh, uh, invite is still valid and will get you into the Zoom. Uh, and the sort of the Zoom meeting that we'll be having, and you can ask questions. So, all right, thank you very much, and good luck. And, we're done. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Gray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.